Thanks, Pete. Through here. Thank you, Josh. What a good person. What a good person. <laughs> Derek's filming us today. For, uh, are you Anne Marie? I am. Uh, we're, we're, we're making a wee poem. I've got a lot. Away by the horizons of the open forum. He was personally distinct as Rudy or Rudy, just as Scotland was nationally different as a Celtic and Gallic country. We do not know that his personal transformation, sorry, we do know that his personal transformation would define him more than any other thing. And it did. Because within the space of a couple of years, he'd edited a, 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 an influential Gallic mag, um, magazine called Guna Blina. Guna Blina means the voice of the year. He kept that going for the best part of 21 years. And Guna Blina transformed himself from being a largely Catholic journal. And in fact, in its first kind of few, few editions, it was strongly Catholic in tone. And in fact, his political analysis uh, really, uh, the historical analysis revolved around blaming not 1707 and Act of Union for Scotland's downfall, but the Reformation and John Knox. So that was, uh, the, that, that was who they were uh, pinning the kind of blame on. But I thought you see, it was also a treasure trove of a lot of kind of Gallic prayers and Gallic hymns, and there was a lot of kind of information and a lot of different people writing for it. But he radicalised himself, and by 1906, 1907, he was starting to actually argue for independence. No other Scottish nationalist was doing that. And I've read and I've studied all the other articles and journals at the time. They're all federalist. We, we, we do not wish to, uh, to end, end the Union. We just want Scotland to have a, a better say, a you know, better rights here within the Union. Erskine swept that away. And in fact, he actually said, you cannot put the camel of nationalism through the eye of the needle of unionism. That was how he put it. And, and he started to get to build a band of people around him, guys like William Gillis, guys like Seamus McGarry, guys like, like um, John MacArthur. They would, they would all kind of, kind of come in as well. It was mostly men, I've got to say, the females around. I don't mean to be sexist about it. That was the group that, 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 that was kind of in there at that time. So it was a hugely politicising experience, followed on by his next journal, The Scottish Review. And The Scottish Review was interesting as well because there's a chap called William Dyack. Now, I could do a, a straw poll, who's heard the Rudy Dayak? <laughs> yeah, probably less people that have heard the Rudy Erskine and Mar through this year. But William Dayak was an Aberdonian trade unionist. William Dayak in, invited Eleanor Marx to Aberdeen to speak on a couple of occasions. William Dayak was a hugely influential um, figure in the North East. He met James Connolly, he met Keith Hardy, he, he, and, and, and welcomed them to a very strong socialist kind of culture within the North East and within Aberdeen. He got William Dyack to start writing for him. And William Dyack started to produce some fantastic articles, critical of the war, and arguing the case that Canon Kenyon Wright would argue many, many years later for that Scottish democracy that, that, that was combining labour and nationality. So it was, again, such a powerful force. And the next little week I'm going to say was really his, his influence for that. Because the birthplace for modern Scottish nationalism wasn't in Scotland. Oh, blimey, governor. It was in London. It was in London. And I'll explain why just through this little reading here. So, the new decade, as in 1900, saw a move into direct, oh, sorry, 1910, I beg your pardon, saw a move into direct political and cultural activism using Gaelic as a truly revolutionary weapon of change. It began in London with fellow exiles and would continue through to a resurrected Highland Land League, raising the battle cry of God Save Scotland and praising imitation of the Irish Fenian martyrs cry before their execution in Manchester in 1867. The writing was still powerful, and the supplementing activity was pow more powerful still. Erskine was defined by it. Ireland would be the inspiration, and London would be the second world. And 
in fact, one that would be its birthplace. In 1910, the Scottish National League, coming the Hallopena, was formed in the Imperial Capital. One writer, Bob Purdy, has argued that this was the birth of modern Scottish nationalism. It's hard to argue with this. What passed for Scottish nationalism at this time has been rightly called unionist nationalism. A call for home rule to make the running of Scotland and Britain smoother, which was aligned to the Liberal Party and which never questioned the integrity of the United Kingdom. As we have seen, there were voices that were edging closer to a more nationalist line. Eskin and Mark took the leap of nationalist faith first. He knew that a truly nationalist organisation needed vision and a basis in culture, with a sp sprinkling of spirituality and soul. These things make you passionate. Home rule makes you functional. So, we're back in this journey. I'm going to jump a, a little bit forward for reasons of time. Erskine, from about 1918, the end of the First World War, raised the battle cry of self-determination for Scotland. Erskine linked in with the Irish, with the Sinn Féin contingent, in trying to get Scottish representation at the Versailles Peace Conference. Now, it was a non-starter. There was no way that the, the, the British government were going to secede self-determination to any of its, um, of its kind of um, dominions. They were the victors in the war. But that, that was part of the strategy. But what's important was that he got in guys like Bob Smiley, the miners leader, the, 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 the Clydeside MPs like Jimmy Maxton. There was a real strong left-wing contingent to, to what was happening and what Erskine was doing at that, that particular time. He also, he also got in tow with John McLean. And it's quite an interesting kind of um, chapter as well because my previous understanding, and I, I was essentially John McLean's Society of Britain, the book and John McLean as well, was that McLean moved towards Scottish independence influenced by Scottish nationalists like Rudy Erskine and William Gillis. I didn't know they actually met until I was in Dublin looking at the Arthur Bryan papers and realised that, that, that actually Erskine came up and met John McLean in, in July. So it, it poses an interesting little timeline for those who are aware of John McLean, the Red Clyde Sider as well. The date was Wednesday, 21st of July, 1920. A nice summer's day in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. Erskine had travelled from London for an interview. We got a huge interview for a job on the press. It was his own word to describe how he had fixed up an appointment with John McLean. McLean was a Marxist and the foremost revolutionary socialist in the British Isles at that time. He had been imprisoned three times for his stance against the war. Until 1918, he had always been an orthodox British socialist with a moderate support for home rule, but never particularly nationalist in outlook. His approach to his own national identity, however, had been seeping into his Marxist politics for a while. And here he was having a cup of tea and a chat with the foremost cultural nationalist in Scotland in his living room in Pollock Shores. It's intriguing to think of what they spoke about. We'll never know for certain. Eskin had promised to give Arthur Bryan, who will come into our story soon, a general idea of how things go at the interview. This may have happened verbally, but certainly not in writing. There were, however, outputs. From these outputs, we can ascertain that the two learned men spoke about Scottish history, the prospects of Scottish independence, Celtic communism, Ireland, and Maclean's dispute with the leaders of the new British communist organisation that was to become the Communist Party of Great Britain. How do we know? Within a month, Maclean had written, published, and was distributing a leaflet, All Hail, the Scottish Workers' Republic. So it gives a timeline into the history of John McLean that is actually really, really powerful. That it wasn't just McLean influenced by reading of what Scottish nationalists were writing at that time, thinking about his own politics, trying to square the circle with his own socialism. He actually sat down with Erskine Amar and was influenced. Influenced by what Erskine Amar had to say to him. That's a real powerful story in terms of what Erskine contributed to, to the, I suppose, the direction of socialism in Scotland at that time. Now, he was a flop. Erskine wasn't a socialist. Incidentally, he wasn't a racist or a fascist either. It was racialism in his politics, he wasn't a fascist. But he wasn't a socialist, but he, had, he played a key role. And one last thing I'll mention in terms of that period of Erskine as well, was that through the activity of Erskine's Scottish National League, it was being debated in the highest circles in Irish Republican politics, and I'm talking about Dibber Lennon, I'm talking about Collins, through Art O'Brien, they were debating about supporting a Scottish rising to divert 
resources away from what's going on in Ireland at that time, which is most mostly your role was the black and tan war that was taking place. So they're talking about diverting resources into Scotland. Now, it was a non start, it wasn't going to happen. But they were talking about it seriously. And they did fund Erskine's uh, newspaper Liberty to, to some serious uh, fund as well. That's not my discovery. The man's just come in there, see your calls, put a large part and find some of that stuff, as has uh, Martin or Cahine and Derry. And very kindly, maybe some of the material available. And get over to, to, to Dublin and see that. Brian Peters added some more stuff onto that as well. It's a really fascinating story. And, and Erskine is so well known in Irish political circles. It's incredible. Even when the James Connolly, um, there was a, a concert for, to, to fund a James Connolly College as well, which was a spin off from James Connolly's birthday celebrations. And they were actually talking about Erskine that night. Because Erskine's theory about the sea divided gale, about you know, the Scots and Irish gales together, struggling together. That's how well known he was in Irish circles. So for somebody who's so little known now, it certainly wasn't the case in terms of his contemporary time. And in fact, the other side, I talked about Erskine's earlier on, the Tartler newspaper, High Society London newspapers were doing interviews with him as well because of his aristocratic kind of background and his high society living. He was quite a man, quite a man. It's sad that today many Scottish nationalists have never heard of him. It's yeah. sad. As I said earlier, he radicalised Scottish nationalism. He took it in a pro independence direction. But he also fell out with the National Party of Scotland. Mm -hmm. He chose isolation in many ways. But he was there. And my last little reading from the book is, I suppose, to, is, is there to remind modern Scottish nationalists as well that at the very first meeting, outdoor meeting, to form the National Party of Scotland, which was a precursor of, the, of the, today's SNP, Erskine was top billed, who was the main speaker. So he was introduced by Robert Bontine, Cunningham Graham, who's quite a character. Mm -hmm. Cunningham Graham was a, a former Liberal and Labour MP, he'd been a gaucho in Argentina, and he served as really quite a, quite a character. So Erskine spoke a very short speech. Erskine was very shy, he hated outdoor speaking, he called it shouting in the air. Hated outdoor speaking. But what he said was, Scotsman in or Scotsman out? Bruce here or Bruce there? The hills here or the hills away? The first thing is that we've got to get hold of the government of our own country. If we do not, if we neglect the exercise, or to exercise the power which we have at the polling booths, then indeed we deserve to be branded with the taunt that we are labouring under an inferiority complex. So for all his eccentric reputation, he was not missing the opportunity by getting lost in the mists of Scottish history. Amidst a near revolutionary call for getting hold of power, this was forced of Scotland's future and the cause he had devoted so much of his life to. His speech was shortened to the point, and it was a speech modern Scottish nationalists should remember that helped launch the party. He set out his stall. Forget Bannockburn, forget the hills and glens. We need to get the reins of government in Scotland. No doubt with a nod to Ireland. And we cannot forget who we are. No language, no nation. He was quite a character, really, Eskimo Amar. And when I say he chose isolation, it's because the SNP chose to fight elections. Eskimo Amar was a, a Sinn Féin. But not the Sinn Féin of the Republican 1918 mould of the Arthur Griffiths 1905 mould. He believed that there shouldn't be, Scottish SNP should not be going into the Westminster Parliament. He believed in a dual monarchy, he believed in Scottish self-sufficiency. Very similar to Griffiths politics <coughs> more than the, the modern Sinn Féin politics. But he held to the Sinn Féin line and he fell out of the National Party of Scotland because he said to have achieved nothing there. <coughs> achieved nothing. And he learnt the lesson from the Parliamentary Party in Ireland, John Redmond uh, and John Dillon's party. Mm -hmm. And as we look at the SNP now, 50 MPs at Westminster, where are they going? So my point about Erskine isn't that Erskine has all the answers, because he doesn't have all the answers. There's questions there, yeah. and I like that. I prefer that. Mm -hmm. But he holds up a mirror, a mirror to the party managers, the party apparatchiks of any party, and especially the SNP. Aye. Where are you going? What's your direction? Yeah. If your independence <coughs> referendum fails at the second attempt, where do you go then? Do you become a British normal unionist political party playing the Westminster game? That's the mirror that Erskine holds up, and I believe it's a question that is worth asking. I'm not saying SNP and MP should have dropped tomorrow, we wouldn't have understood, not at all. But I do, in the book, come up with two or three different scenarios that they could possibly, they could possibly do something.
So he is, for me, a forgotten hero of Scottish nationalism. He is someone to be remembered. He is someone who, as we look at the Gaelic language in Scotland and Ireland, I've got to say, which is on its knees, he gives us, again, some sort of real inspiration in terms of the fact that if you lose your language, you lose your culture, you lose a little bit of your soul. And in fact, my last chapter is, I've turned James Connolly in his head. James Connolly um, wrote a, a brilliant a piece of work on Labour nationality and religion, debating with a Catholic priest, Father F. Cain, and, and obviously debated the, how those, those, those kind of concepts, faith, nationality, um, and class can come together. Eskin did the same. He did it in his own class background. The the last chapter, aristocracy, nationality, and religion. Yeah? And it's interesting how he actually brought those things together as well, because that's, that's what, what, what defined them as well. So for me, he's a forgotten hero of Scottish nationalism, and I thank you for coming here to hear about him. And I want to finish off a poem. And it's not a poem that's in, the, the, that's in my book, because I only discovered this poem in doing subsequent um, research. And actually it's a poem that was in the, the, the Clarion newspaper. And the Clarion newspaper was edited by a guy called Robert Blatchford. Robert Blatchford wrote the Merry England, which is one of the early kind of British Marxian kind of books. And John McLean said it was highly influential for him. So on the 13th of August 1898, I came across this, this uh, poem, and I thought it was really, really powerful. So I hope you don't mind. It's quite short, but I'll read it to you. Read by a guy called Joaquin Miller. Joaquin Miller was a, an Amer a Californian writer and naturalist, and a friend of P.T. Barnum, the greatest showman. <laughs> yeah. This is a poem called The Truly Brave. And what for the man who went forth for the right, was hit in the battle with Sean of a limb? Why honour for him who falls in the fight, falls wounded of limb and crippled for life? Give honour, give glory, give pensions for him. Give bread and give shelter for babes and for wife. But what of the hero who battles alone? In battles of thought for God set him down, who fought all alone and who fell overthrown, in reason at last through the hardness and hate. Why jipe him and jeer him and point as you frown to that lonely lone hero who dared challenge fate? God pity, God pardon, and God help us all. That young man of promise, wherever he be, that young man of promise, wherever he fall. For fall, he must fall. It is a thousand to one. Let us plant him a rose, let us plant a great tree to hide his poor grey from the world and the sun. I tell you, twere better to cherish that soul, that soldier who battles with thought for a sword, that climbs the steep ramparts where wrong has control and falls beaten back by the rude trampling horde. Aye, better to cherish his words and his worth than all the Napoleons that people the earth. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.